Greetings, you curious, you courageous hurly burlyites. Before we start the pod, just a thank you for the continuing, mostly positive feedback and ideas for the show on Apple Podcasts rating and review. At Air Quotes Media, we really appreciate it when you leave a word for us there, even when it's brief. Like this one from GoatBoy763. I listen every week. Not sure what else has to be said. Thank you for that, GoatBoy763. It's not every day I get to say GoatBoy on the pod. Also, your alias. It raises the question, who are the other 762 Goat Boys? All right. Our guest today is renowned urban planner, developer, lecturer, and public speaker, Jennifer Kiesmatt. Jennifer has been named one of the most powerful people in Canada by McLean's, one of the most influential by Toronto Life. She spent five years as Toronto's chief city planner, where she was celebrated for her forward thinking and collaborative approach to city building. She's a distinguished visitor in residence emeritus at the University of Toronto, and she shares her vision for cities of the future and the importance of the public sector's role through publications like The Guardian, The Globe and Mail, McLean's Foreign Affairs, and The Toronto Star. Today, Jennifer is the CEO of the Keysmack Group and a founding partner of Marquee Developments, where she's developing new communities across the GTA as sustainable, livable places that prioritize access to high-quality, affordable rental housing. So it's no surprise where we're going to go with this conversation. We'll focus in a little bit on Toronto, but we're really going to be talking about cities and what their challenges are, particularly with respect to housing and homelessness and transit and uh, moving people moving people around and general public infrastructure and safety, all the things that every major city in Canada is facing. We're really delighted to have Jennifer here as such an expert to talk us through these things. Hey, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you for the invitation. Thrilled to be having this chat. <laughs> are you on vacation or are you working? I'm I'm working from away, which is now socially acceptable. So I'm happy, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy about that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's been a big boon to me too. I'm enjoying it very much. Hey, Chief City Planner for Toronto. By the way, my sister was a city planner in the city of Regina back in the 80s and 90s. Oh. Uh, head of social planning for the city. So I have a little bit exactly. of experience with this through... Uh, osmosis, but um, chief city planner, what is that job? Oh, what does so it entail? It, well, the funny thing is it's different in different places. So the title can be a little bit confusing because you'll see, um, you know, in a small little town, there'll be a chief planner. And often that person is the, the sole uh, person in charge of planning for the municipality. But in the city of Toronto, it's a unique position in Canada because, of course, we're an amalgamated city, 2.9 million people. So there are a series of directors, there are seven directors across the city, who in effect are also like chief planners because they have a tremendous amount of um, authority around land use planning, design, transit planning, all of those matters. So in the city of Toronto, the way it's structured, and it's not structured this way anywhere else in the country, including in Vancouver, the role encompasses strategic planning, land use planning, zoning, urban design, heritage planning, and community planning. And did I say transit planning? Because that's a really, really big one that isn't in the role in any other places. So it really is a chief planner role in the city of Toronto because the idea is that um, the person who is the head of planning has the mandate to um, both think strategically and recommend to city council how to advance uh, into the future in keeping with the public interest, while also at the same time implementing and responding to immediate challenges. You know, developer applications come in, you have to evaluate them based on a series of criteria um, as per the regulatory context of the Planning Act um, and recommend, make a recommendation to council. So, I, look, I could answer that question for a couple Yeah, hours. no, no, but that was that, great. That's like the overarching snapshot. So the first thing that occurred to me when you were saying that is, um, when I'm running a political campaign, there's a number of tactics one can employ in a different circumstance. And you choose the tactics you're going to employ based on what your strategy is. So all those things you're talking about sound to me like tactics. What's the strategy? Like, how do you decide? what you're going to do and where you're going to do it. What's the overall, where does the overall vision around which you make these decisions come from? I love this question because this was really my starting point 
and I was very clear about this when I went through the selection process, that I felt it needed to be a strategic role where you think really strategically and tactically about how you build consensus around a future vision for the city. And so in many ways, the authority in a role like the city of Toronto to actually advance a vision, it's kind of soft, right? Um, I had pages and pages of delegated authorities, things that I could do on my own authority. They were delegated to me by the city of Toronto. To be very specific, for example, there's a green roof bylaw, but I had the authority to forgive that green roof bylaw under certain circumstances. I had discretionary powers to do that there's, and there's all kinds of discretionary authorities. But really, if you want to advance a vision for the future, um, you have to work obviously in lockstep with elected officials. I was there at the leisure of elected officials and I couldn't get too far out ahead of them. But at the same time, I needed to be kind of pushing them. They needed to bump up against the limitations of their very local constituents and what their local constituents were asking for. And I had to kind of push them to bump up against that. And one of the strategic ways that I did that was through consensus building grassroots processes. So what I did that was pretty radical was to go out to the public with everything that we did. In fact, I'll give you a really specific example. Um, when I started, you know, I was pretty active on Twitter and um, the uh, the city manager decided that uh, he didn't he didn't want the chief planner tweeting. And um, at this time, like tw tweeting was pretty early in its, you know, municipalities didn't have Twitter handles yet. Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, a little bit of an edgier thing. And so I said, well, no, like I need to tweet because that's the fundamental way that I can communicate directly with anyone who wants to hear what I have to say. I don't have to call up the Toronto Star and lobby them to get my opinion in the paper. I can actually get it out there on Twitter. So that was a that was a tactic to advance a strategy based on a vision for the future of the city. And that vision is contained in the city's official plan. All right. And and so what role do elected officials play in that? And is there enough consistency in that composition of people to have an enduring vision of a city? Well, this is um this is a this is a fantastic question. And I would argue that we demonstrated during that time period that we do have an enduring vision. There's, you know, little ebbs and flows and bumps along the way, but the enduring vision of becoming a very dense urban transit oriented place, which is a vision that isn't new in the city. Um, it's gone a little sideways now and then, but it's not new. That is the enduring vision. Um, that vision withstood a mayor, Rob Ford, who was completely anti that vision, who was counter to that vision. But the strength of the public policy um, meant that we didn't take a massive U-turn. We took a bit of a U-turn. <laughs> like, let's be real here. Yep. We spent a lot of time, you know, debating frivolous things and dealing with, you know, what I would call significant, but at the same time, petty governance issues. You know, the mayor um, sending out uh, fundraising letters on his mayoral, you know, letterhead that took up about a day in city council. On the one hand, it's petty, but on the other hand, it's pretty significant, right? From a governance perspective. We spent a lot of time doing things like that, which meant we couldn't advance the bigger vision of becoming a dense urban city in those moments. But at the end of the day, for a variety of reasons, and because can of I, checks and balances- Can I ask you, are you, are you telling me, because we're getting into politics here, are you telling me that you had a mayor who came in who loved cars, and wanted to change everything about the city so that it was for cars. And that the bureaucracy actively resisted his agenda. No, not the bureaucracy. This is a very important nuance. Okay. Existing council approved policy. And this is why what Doug Ford has done, Premier Ford has done with the Green Belt is so significant. Because he circumvented regulations and laws that are in place precisely to prevent uh, an actor for acting completely independently. So let's go back to the car example in the city of Toronto. Um, it was no secret that Rob Ford wanted to get rid of streetcars. He hated streetcars, um, which of course is profoundly naive. We have streetcars that 
carry more people in a day than entire transit systems in Canada. Regina is probably one of them, hmm. um, but the King Street car carries. If more Regina people. has a transit system, I'm unaware of it. So. <laughs> it, it does. It does. <laughs> um, but you know. But the point being that it w- that would have been a profoundly destructive move for the city. But he couldn't just unilaterally go and do that because there are well, there's existing policy that had to be changed and that policy had to be changed through a public process and that public process does actually take a couple of years and during that couple of years you can have a very robust conversation with the public about the implications of that change which we did we did that it was called feeling congested the whole reason i did that massive consultation was to demonstrate the link between the thriving of the future of toronto and density and transit that those two things have to be conjoined, that you can't add more people um, and add more cars. That's just an absurdity. And so I would argue that existing public policy and mechanisms in place to change that policy prevented, um, you know, kind of these wildcat wildcat actions that were inconsistent with a bigger, longer-term vision for the city. And that's why, you know, what's happened on the green belt is so profound because, there are policies that are in place to prevent what happened from happening without a public process and a public debate. And that public process and that public public debate debate was ignored. And there needs to be accountability for that because I think it's pretty clear that the public is not in support of what Premier Ford advanced. Okay. So well, that's, that's a good segue into what's on everybody's mind in Canada these days, which is housing and all of the various permutations of that issue, social housing, rental accommodation, homes. Uh, we're apparently millions of units behind where we need to be. Um, let's start with this. What role do municipalities, because I've talked to people about housing on this show before, and some people have laid a lot of blame on municipalities for zoning, for regulatory charges, Um, permit charges, whatever they are, fees that developers have to pay to get stuff built. And some people are kind of making municipalities the villain of the housing story. What is the municipality's role in getting housing built? Like, for example, I'm told there are hundreds of thousands of places in Toronto that could be built that aren't being built. So why? So there's a couple of parts to this. The first I'll say in response to the last part of your question, um, there's a significant amount of housing that is approved, and that's the role of the municipality. The municipality is a regulator. They say yes or no, and they, you know, it's much more complicated than that, and it's a negotiated process, but they say yes or no. So here's the weird part. We like to blame municipalities, but there's hundreds of thousands of units approved but not yet built. So the municipality's actually done its job in those instances. It's approved those units, but why aren't they getting built? Well, they're not getting built for lots of reasons. The only thing the municipality does is enable. It does not require. So if I go through a rezoning process for a new, you know, 60-story condo, let's even say 20% of it is going to be affordable, I get my approvals as a developer. I'm now not required to build that building. I have the, I have the permission to build it, but I'm not required to. And that's where things start breaking down. So And I don't want to suggest that the municipality is blameless. Well, and we can go into a a deeper conversation about the role of the municipality. But if we take that case study, for example, okay, so we've got our approvals. Is this a gold mine? Why aren't the developers rushing in to build this building? This is the question. Well, (laughs) um, I'll give you a very specific example. Um, We have a project where... Um, through the process of our approvals, um, you know, we submitted our application, we went through the approvals process, it took longer than it should have, but we have our approvals. During the period of the approvals process, interest rates have gone up 10 times. So the borrowing costs on this project, it's a large project, our borrowing straw costs have gone up by $76 million. So there's, we are proceeding for a variety of reasons, and I can get into the example in more detail, but many developers make the calculus. Okay, so my borrowing costs have gone up. My construction costs have gone up. Interest rates affect construction in a significant way. And what's happening to the housing market right now? Prices are going down. (laughs) 
So that what does that mean? The you know, if you were to chart this, the gap in terms of the risk, the risk is going up really significantly. My costs are up, but my sale price is down at a very basic level. You know, it doesn't take a very um, complicated analysis to realize that some developers say, well, maybe I should wait this out. Maybe I should see what's going to happen in 2024 with interest rates. Uh, maybe I should see what's going to happen in 2024 with construction costs, because if enough people start sitting it out, then construction costs start going down again, which right. would be advantageous to the project pro forma. So there's a it, it's there's a calculus that has to be made, and we can talk a little bit about the other levels of government and the roles that they play in this. Um, but the municipality has nothing to do with anything of what's happening on the financial viability of a development project. And right now, the financial viability of a development project is um, is really questionable on many sites. Development yeah. charges are one way that municipalities can mitigate those costs. But of course, in the low interest rate environments, what did every municipality in the country do? They raised their interest, they raised their development charges. And now those development charges, you know, frequently kill the viability of a project. In Toronto, what are they per unit ballpark? Um, well, it depends on um, the type of unit. I think, um, uh, I don't have that off the top of my head, but I know. When Order you of take- magnitude? Uh, I think, you know, I don't want to be, it's, it's, it's over a hundred thousand. Um, you know, I can pull that, I can pull that number up, but if you take the development charges at the municipal level and you take the HST at the federal level on what we're seeing on our projects right now is the money we pay in government is significantly higher than profit. So everyone likes to say big, bad developers and Look, let's be real. There are some big, bad developers, <laughs> but there's lots of other people trying to do good stuff who are just going, I'm getting killed right now. I have to wait it out. I have to sit on the sidelines. And that's terrible when you have a supply crisis. Right. There is no innovation without its very close shared first syllable cousin, investment. Investment of gray matter, time, money, blood, sweat, tears, and any other resource that's required to make a new thing a reality. And then to do it all over again and innovate afresh. That calculus has always been a driving force behind our presenting sponsor, TELUS. In fact, it drives their social purpose. They have a long history of innovating products, innovating entire business units, innovating social programs, and investing behind them to do good for people. Because to TELUS, That's good business. Well, here's another one, Hurley Burleyites. A little earlier this year, TELUS launched Canada's first 5G subscription phone service offered by their flanker brand, Public Mobile. Canadians want choice. They want the flexibility to adjust their phone service on their terms without the weight of a long-term contract. TELUS knows that. You know what else Canadians want? The power and speed of 5G. Reliable 5G. Public Mobile gives them all of that in our largest urban centers and in more remote parts of the country because it all rides on the award-winning TELUS network. It's 5G capability that's as simple and straightforward as it gets. Just choose the features and speed that work best for you and pay only for those on a recurring monthly subscription plan. And the whole thing can be stopped or changed at any time with no restrictions, just like any other subscription in your life. Plus, it's all digital first on the new public mobile app. Activate your subscription, make changes, get support, and earn rewards without any lineups or waiting on the phone, subjecting your ears and your soul to something that bears only a slight resemblance to music. Learn more about it at publicmobile.ca. You are not a fan of Sprawl. There's a person, there's a guy from the States that I'm a big fan of. His name is Chris Arnotti. I've had him on the podcast a couple of times. He wrote a book called Dignity. And he's a guy who used to be a broker in Wall Street. And to relieve tension, he started walking. And he ended up walking into neighborhoods he wasn't supposed to be in. And he found that he enjoyed that. And so he quit Wall Street and just walks around America and talks to people and documents it. He said the other day, I read him said the other day that having walked all over the United States and talked to as many people as he's talked to, that the American dream, in part, consists of a house on a, on a plot of land with a yard and a garage, and that that's what everybody aspires to. 
That's what everybody wants. I think there's a lot of truth in that in Canada too. And you're saying they can't have that. Well, let's dig a little deeper into the dream. Um, because look, a lot of people dream of having a pool or a house on a ravine or being right next to rapid transit as well. Um, and the question is, can we structure our society to deliver as much as possible on the dream? The problem with the suburban dream is twofold. One is that the reality doesn't often hold to the dream. So I'll give you an example. Um, about 15 years ago, I, as a private consultant, we created a strategic plan for the city of Mississauga through a massive consultation process. We had over 100,000 people participate in this process in a substantive way, in workshops and public meetings. And we part of what we were trying to get at is what does the future of Mississauga look like in, in light of the fact that Mississauga was out of land, right? There had been this very suburban model where growth was paying for, growth was kind of back paying the finances for the municipality. And when Miss Mississauga ran out of land, suddenly there was no revenue because there was no more development taking place. And all of a sudden it, you know, to her credit, Hazel McCallion realized, wait a minute, I, my growth model breaks down when I run out of land, I've got to start, I've got to start growing up. And so we were hired to do a whole process around what does the future of Mississauga look like? How do we create a viable downtown? Um, our work was the impetus behind the LRT and the notion that Mississauga could have a linear, intense, dense corridor. And that was, um, from an, a built form perspective, really a tactic to figure out how do you take this sprawling municipality and create some some there there some some urban in, urban intensity the fascinating thing about those consultations is that we learned that um many new canadians came to mississauga and were thrilled with their a big house and their two car garage and often lived in multi generational homes and then something interesting happened the dream started to fall apart and the dream started to fall apart for two reasons. One, the long commute. These families sat around round tables with us and said, we spend all of our time in the car. We spend 30% of our income on our cars, multiple cars, because everyone who can drive has to have a car, on insurance, on gas. We spend hours and hours a day in our car. And we, the, the dream is, the dream falls apart in a dense urban region. I think the dream actually works in small town America. Honestly, I really do believe it works in small town America where you can get anywhere in five minutes and where you don't have a lot of growth. But in a dense urban region, the dream falls apart very quickly because it takes you a minimum of 45 minutes to get anywhere that you want to go and you need to drive. So these first generation Canadians who come here from all over the world, were craving for a different kind of urban form. They also were despondent about the fact that their children were all moving into downtown Toronto, all of their children. And their children didn't want to live where they grew up. Why? Because they didn't want to drive everywhere. They, they wanted to be, and if you look, you know, it's fascinating. We, at, at, uh, years later when I was chief planner, we did a condo study in downtown Toronto to understand the needs of our urban condo communities. And we had a whole program that grew out of that calling growing up vertical. And what we learned was that, you know, the, ur the urban elite kind of thing is pretty funny because you know who lives in downtown Toronto? It's the urban you know, second generation kids who grew up in the 905. <laughs> right. They're all living in downtown Toronto because they're like, yeah, I grew up with a long commute. No, thanks. I would rather have less space, more public amenity. So look, um, I'm actually, I believe in choice. I'm a like a choice theorist when it comes to urban, urban planning. I believe that we need a tremendous amount of choice that people should be able to choose whatever they want. Right. But I also believe that people should pay for their choices. So right now we subsidize sprawl and we subsidize it with our urban development. We need to flip that around. A lot of people would change their mind about where they want to live if they had to, if we had full cost accounting for suburban development, which we don't right now. We really radically subsidize sprawl. We subsidize transit to the, you know, a crazy amount per capita in sprawling communities. Couldn't, so you I just argue, think couldn't you argue I'm being subsidized? I live right downtown Toronto. My townhouse has probably tripled in value in the last 10 years. My property taxes haven't. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So um, property taxes are different from what I'm talking about. What I'm talking no. about is from a development charge perspective. Right. right. Um, and yeah. from a development charge perspective, what happens is every time we build a condo in downtown Toronto, we resurface a road in the suburbs or we we build a new park or we, we invest in some amenity in the suburbs because of the way we've structured our development charges. 50 percent of them get spread out citywide. Yeah. So if you had more of a right sizing, um, someone with a townhome um, in a suburban location uh, there's a much higher um, subsidy to the infrastructure than there is in a in an urban location. And if we right size that, suddenly the appeal of living in a suburban location would change significantly if, if you had full cost accounting. But look, the long commute is screwing it up already. The dream doesn't hold. Although I will say, and this can't be stressed enough, it does hold in many small American towns, like really small American towns. There's a lot of American towns of 10, 20, 30,000 people. Uh, but even if, you know, you look at a place like Collingwood, Ontario, which is 23,000 people, um, it's already bumping up against the sprawl model because it just doesn't have enough road infrastructure for all the cars it's adding. So, you know, it falls apart. That's the problem. It falls apart with a little bit of poking. Right. Okay. Did I read you say somewhere that lack of housing is an issue in attracting new investment and, and business to Toronto? That one of the things that's keeping, I think I saw you say this perhaps in connection with Amazon, that it was an issue. Absolutely. So I was involved um, in working very closely with Amazon on the Amazon bid. Uh, and what was interesting about that was um, one of the reasons I was very involved was because they couldn't they couldn't get their heads around how they could bring hundreds of thousands, sorry, um, thousands of jobs for people making $150,000 a year and where these people would live in Toronto. That was the problem. That was like a massive stumbling block. Like, look, there's a bigger right. political story behind that whole bidding process. And for a variety of reasons, it's not a bad thing that we didn't get it. But it's a reality that the during the due diligence process, <laughs> we talked a ton about housing and where people were going to live and how people could possibly afford to live in Toronto. Um, this happens at universities as well. I've, I've spoken with the presidents of all the major universities in the GTA who will have, they'll recruit new faculty from across North America. They'll go through the whole process. And then when it comes down to the salary negotiation, they run into a problem because, you know, uh, faculty can you know, for the same salary can get a job at Ohio State, which is a great university where the average home is $350,000 or for the same salary, they can get a, you know, a job in Toronto where the average home is just over a million. Uh, where, where, what choice do you think people are going to make? It's right. a quality of life issue. Right. To appreciate how important Canada's grain crop is to the world, consider this. The black soil belt that stretches across Ukraine and much of Eastern Europe, one of the world's greatest agri-food regions, is a war zone. Russia has not only abandoned its commitment to allow safe passage of Ukrainian grain, it is now attacking grain storage facilities, attempting to destroy precious reserves of food. All of that makes Canadian grain even more crucial to global markets. And the job of shipping it smoothly and competently falls to railways like our sponsor CN. That job is such a national priority that CN is required by law to file an annual grain plan to the federal government, assessing whether it has the capacity to handle expected crop yields. In plain language, the answer this year is yes. CN has more than enough resources to do the job. CN puts a great deal of revenue back into its trains, tracks, and technology. So its fleet of locomotives and hopper cars is newer and faster than ever. And its laser focus on ensuring trains depart and arrive on time has paid off. Last year, the average velocity of CN trains, the number of miles a railway car travels in a given day, was the best in years. So yes, a qualified yes, because so much is out of the railway's hands. There's a new federal regulation in place that obliges railways to deliver cargo to competitors, sometimes several times between origin and destination, at the whim of multinational grain corporations. That will soak up time and money. And it remains next to impossible to load grain at the Port of Vancouver's terminals when it's raining. And in, in Vancouver, you know, rain. 
Grain companies, not the railways, operate those terminals. Several days of rainfall can jam up the entire system, causing severe backups and delays. CN trains sit idle, unable to unload, unable to return for new shipments. Meanwhile, ports in eastern Canada, which have no such issues, are underutilized by multinational grain shippers. And of course, as we are seeing, weather is becoming ever more extreme and unpredictable. CN is absolutely committed to moving Canada's grain to market on schedule. But increasingly, the only way to guarantee that is tight, determined, relentless collaboration and transparency among all the players in the grain supply chain. Farmers, grain companies, truckers, railways, ports and maritime vessels, to name a few. CN respectfully submits requiring that kind of collaboration and transparency is an appropriate role for government. Okay. Let's talk about homelessness a little bit. Um, you know, uh, Toronto is seeing, I think, a significant expansion of this. I'm noticing it personally in my own neighborhood now that there are tents in the parks and things like that in the morning. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, morally offensive that this exists in our city. Um, and yet, in, in American cities, we're seeing it get literally out of control into essentially refugee encampments like you would see in countries that are having civil wars and things like that. Um, what can we do about this? Are there cities that do this well? Are there places that know what to do about this? It's such a complicated problem because it isn't a housing supply problem per se, really, is it? Well, it is It is. It is partly, and there, there's there's one place in particular that's that's figured it out. So I'll talk about that place. But I just also want to point out that homelessness used to be a big city problem because you know a big city um, was kind of a magnet for the larger center, and people in need would go to where the services are in the big city. But there was an article in the Globe and Mail just a couple of days ago where the mayor of Durham and uh, the regional chair, a few other people were um, speaking out about the homelessness crisis in Durham region. Um, London, Ontario is a municipality of 250,000 people with a phenomenal um, homelessness crisis. Um, the embankment for about five kilometers along the Thames River is filled with tents year round. So um, what's happened in the past couple of years and in, that is new um, is that we have seen this become, we've seen homelessness become something pervasive everywhere. It's no longer a big city, a big city challenge. It's happening everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course that's magnified, magnified in big cities. So, you know, I think there's, there's, there's three parts to this. There's um, some of which are, are not my expertise, but inter intersect with what I do. One is mental health issues. Another is drug issues. Um, and then the third, of course, is access to housing. And those three things have to be taken together. Um, you know, there's in London, Ontario, there is a major fentanyl problem. <laughs> um, it's, you can't talk about homelessness and not talk about fentanyl in London, Ontario. Um, there's a mental health um, piece to this. We know we have every metric imaginable coming out of the pandemic around the implication of locking people down and the stress that that caused families and households. And in particular, the women and children that are in distress. Our mayor has declared an epidemic of intimate partner violence in the city of Toronto. And I don't know why we're not talking about that more because we're seeing women and children that are homeless in a way that we've never seen in in my lifetime um so i think it's critical to talk about all three of those things i also think be, because it's those three three things which um are cross-sectorial and from a policy pre perspective cross sectors that's one of the reasons why it's really tricky to solve it, <laughs> you've got you've you've got these different silos and yeah, they're yeah. not they're not interacting to address this issue um a portion of it is absolutely housing supply it absolutely is. And so when we look at an example globally of where this issue has been, for lack of a better word, solved, we, we can look at Helsinki. And what Helsinki did is fascinating because Helsinki said, look, we're not going to focus on shelters. What we're going to do is focus on rental supply and ensuring that we have affordable rental supply. 
But then what we're also going to do is focus on wraparound services for people who are in need. And this is something we really don't do in Toronto. People go into our shelter system and there's no services. Um, the services are almost non-existent relevant, rel relative to this scale. You know, safe injection sites is a really interesting example of that. The premise of safe injection sites is that people um, are plugged into a system of services, but we don't actually have all the services. So people are going to the safe injection sites, but they're not getting plugged into the supports that can lead to healing and wellness. Right. So we're maintaining a crisis rather than resolving a crisis. Um, the fact that we got out of social housing, the, the data is phenomenal on this. Um, in the 70s and 80s, we were still building social housing. There is no social housing being built anymore. There is a um, continuum. When you say we, who do you mean? Uh, I mean, all levels of government, mostly the provincial government, because Mike Harris downloaded social housing to the city and the city just, you know, didn't have the wherewithal to even manage. We don't even well, in, fa in fairness, the feds in the mid 1990s got out of it themselves, right? The feds, they got out of it completely. They also got out of um, we had phenomenal programs that created an entire generation of co-ops in both Toronto and in Vancouver. Um, but those programs don't exist anymore, and we don't see a new generation of co-ops, which are a really great approach to stable, affordable housing, because they also have, by virtue of the community that's created, a whole series of supports to keep people in their housing even when they go through a crisis. So co-ops are a very powerful community-based model for housing um, that Rather than having social services providing care, the community is providing care for one another. But we haven't been expanding that. Our population's been growing. We haven't been expanding access to that kind of housing. So in some ways, like I'm overwhelmed, even as I'm just telling you this, there's failures on so many levels. Um, and, and then on top of that, we have a phenomenal housing supply shortage, whereas, you know, Young people could come into this city. Newcomers could come into this city. And within a relatively short period of time, they could access stable affordable housing it's not the case anymore they they, right. they simply cannot and so um and, and it's interesting to talk so, about so so just i need to be i just need to get my head around this and i don't yeah. know how to say this in a way that might not sound crass how many people are homeless what percentage of the people who are homeless in toronto for example would be just fine in their lives if they could have a, a, a low-cost apartment or something like that. If they just had housing, they'd be fine. Versus what percentage of the homeless are people that not having a home is just one of their problems? So I'll tell you why it's almost impossible to answer that question. And it's because of the way homelessness, mental health, addiction, all very rapidly become entwined. And uh, so I'll give you a very specific example. Um, Years ago, when I was setting up a not-for-profit, working with at-risk youth, I talked to a young guy on the streets of Toronto who was homeless and addicted to drugs, who was in his late 20s, and he had crutches. And he was a, he was a floorer. He installed flooring, and he got a knee injury, so he couldn't bend and get on the floor and install floor, flooring. And within a, couple of, within a couple of months, he couldn't pay his rent. And when he couldn't pay his rent, he was out on the streets. Um, after several months on, in a shelter, um, you can imagine the mental health issues that that are created. He was isolated from society. His family, which lived on the West Coast, he was afraid to talk to and to tell them he was living on the, on the streets. Um, within a year, he was addicted to drugs um, and he had become drug involved. Um, as a result of being in the shelter system. And look, I don't know what happened to this this young man, but um, this was a guy with housing and a good job, <laughs> you know? Right, yeah. Like, okay. like this isn't the other. This is, you know, your cousin, your uncle, your your aunt, right? Like, um, there's one degree of separation for all of us um, from people who end up, end up on, on the streets. Um, I feel this acutely because... My family came here um, after the Second World War, and when they arrived, um, they lived in a hotel. And while they lived in that hotel, and they were not people of means, but they had some money. Back then, my grandfather, when they were living in that hotel, went out and bought a piece of land. And, you know, I have to get the numbers from my dad, but I'm sure it was next to nothing. He bought a piece of land and he built a house. <laughs> 
you know. And when they moved from the they moved from the hotel into the house, and, you know, and that was the beginning of their of their becoming stabilized in Canadian society and their upward mobility. Well, everyone knows that's not happening today. Right. Right. That's just not happening today. So we need a new model in the 21st century for integrating newcomers. And we're acting like we don't. I think that's a problem. <clears throat> okay. Um, do you have a suggestion about what a first step might be on the homelessness front? Well, I think a very first step is that we need to... Um, the, the part that I know the most, most about myself is around driving housing supply and getting a tremendous amount of housing built. And one of the reasons I left the city as a chief planner uh, to create a development company to do this is precisely because there aren't really a lot of actors, um, quite frankly, with the expertise on both the regulatory side and the building side in this space who are approaching this from the lens of there being a public interest in housing delivery. Um, there are some smaller act actors, there's some great smaller not-for-profits building 40, 50, 60, if we're lucky, 100 units at a time, but we need tens of thousands of new homes. And that's, that's what we've set out to do in my company. Our goal um, is to build 10,000 homes in 10 years, and we're on target to do that. Um, I would love for there to be some copycats of people copying our company and doing what we're doing, what we're doing. Um, you know, some of our biggest roadblocks in doing that have been all levels of government have been the biggest roadblocks. Mm. Um, so, you know, we need to stop messing around with, you know, the green belt. And yeah, I'm not going to let that go because I'm very angry about it. Um, the, you know, a very simple thing that the provincial government can do right now, there are, uh, tens of thousands of units that developers want to build that are in the queue for an appeal at the Ontario Municipal Board. We ended up in this situation. We waited an entire year uh, to get a hearing date and to get a hearing. And of course, because it was a frivolous appeal by a NIMBY group, the day of the hearing, they dropped it. So we waited an entire year for nothing. Do you know what happened in that year? interest rates went nuts. We could have mm. locked in our construction financing at a significantly lower cost. So that year is a big freaking deal, like a big deal to the amount of affordable housing we're delivering because we're maximizing the amount of affordable housing we can deliver on every project. You know, our borrowing costs went through the roof. So um, the that's a very tangible, specific thing the Ontario government could do. They could hire many, many more people to be expediting appeals at the OLT very specific thing that they can do tomorrow that would have a tangible impact on housing deliverable. The federal government, forgive the HST. The HST on rental projects and on affordable projects, forgive them immediately. Um, that will flip many development projects that are currently approved but not viable to build from a financial perspective. It would flip it into viability. Um, the federal government needs to be very focused on addressing our skilled labor shortage. We've got to bring the cost of construction down, and we're not going to do that unless we address the labor shortage. And the Toronto Board of Trade has been yelling about this for years and years and years. They've been saying that a crisis is coming, and you know what? It's here. Now it's here. They started talking about this about 10 years ago. Well, now this, it's here. This is an emerging debate, I think, in the country about the nexus between immigration and housing. And the federal government is arguing as you have just argued, that we actually can't build the homes we need if we don't get the people here to build them for us, which sounds a little odd to people, I think. And and at, this, at the same time, people are making, I think, a more intuitive connection between adding, like, let's say if, if 500,000 were leaving aside the international students and leaving aside temporary foreign workers. But if we're just looking at applications for citizenship, if they let in 500,000 people every year, what, 200 and some thousand of them will go to Toronto, correct? Yes, that's right. right. So that just seems, I think, intuitively to people to be exacerbating the problem. There's a bigger part to this, um, in my mind. Um, when I went to high school, there was a section of our school for shop um, where young people learned trades. And we got rid of that in our public schools. We've sort of demonized the trades. 
Um, and we need plumbers and electricians and drywallers and builders. And, um, the, you know, I have a nephew who's an electrician. It's a great job. <laughs> um, he has lots of work. He loves what he does. He's fantastic with his hands. Um, and for some reason, we have not created a pipeline of talent. Um, we have, I believe, over, um, we've overemphasized um, other parts of participation in Canadian society to the detriment of recognizing that building things is not only can it be a good life, it's a, an important and critical part of our Canadian economy and that we want to encourage the building up of skilled labor within this country. And this kind of notion that skilled labor is for immigrants is very strange to me. Um, and we've done that. We've, we, you know, we need to bring the trades back and trade schools back in Ontario. We need to create a pipeline of talent um, of skilled workers. And look, our unions are all over this. We should be partnering with unions to get these programs off the ground. Um, so I don't think, you know, sometimes we we create a tension that doesn't need to exist. Right. Um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't bring in skilled immigrants. Obviously we should, but we also should be creating a pipeline of skilled talent and, and switching, flipping the narrative on skilled labor, because skilled labor is a really critical part of the Canadian economy. As we're seeing this crisis is linked in deeply to a lack of skilled labor. Right. Interesting. Okay. Let's talk about transit for a few minutes before we run out of time here. Um, so what's the future of the car in Canadian urban cities, in Canadian urban centers, major cities? What's the future of the car? Ah, that's a story yet to be written. <laughs> it could go in a lot of different directions. Um, the great news about what's happening in Toronto right now is that we're building a tremendous amount of transit and a lot of folks don't, um, necessarily realize this. I'm always shocked by this when people say we haven't built transit in 20 years. And I'm like, yeah, we built we, we've built a new subway. We built two new subway lines. We've um, we've ex we have a BRT network now that we didn't have five years ago. Um, the challenge is, I think we've done a really well, and we built an LRT that we don't have operational. Um, unfortunately, it's just sitting there. We'll get there. to that. We'll yeah. get to that. And, and we and we should talk about that because I don't understand why people aren't talking about that more and why the media isn't holding this government's feet to the fire, which is their which is their job. Um, but you know, I believe quite firmly that if we stay on our path of adding density in existing built up areas and prioritizing density and mixed use housing around our transit infrastructure that we will we will make the transition to uh creating a city that is fundamentally a walkable place and there's many of us i'm in this category who already live that way in the city right but, I get in my car when I have to, I take Uber when I have to, but I'm always going to be first choice is my bike. Well, first choice is walking. If I can do something within walking distance and you can do a lot within walking distance in Toronto, second choice is my bike. Third choice is transit. And then if I have to, for whatever reason, um, I'm going to get in my car. So do you like driving? Add, do you like do driving? Like, do you like, like driving? driving? I actually like driving on country roads. Like I like, you know, I, I like a road trip, but I really hate driving in the city. And I like, you know, look, this is my big, my big secret. Because people like, like love cars, right? Like I, people, I was going to say, I, mm -hmm. I love cars. We put a tremendous amount of um, design ingenuity into cars. So there's a lot of very beautifully designed cars. Um, but I just don't like cars in cities. I, they, they come into conflict with pedestrians. They ruin pedestrianism. They don't, they don't fit in cities. So I think it's possible to like cars and to like driving and to also at the same time go, there's some places where cars just don't work very well because they take up too much space and they ruin the urban fabric. I'm in that camp. Right. Okay. So just so, I, just so I'm clear, when the Eglinton Crosstown, if ever, is done and the Ontario line is built, subway line is built, will Toronto have a good transit system? Well, or is there lots more to be done after that? Well, there's a piece that you're missing. And this is the piece that you're missing, which is the operations of that transit system. So like you can look at a 
map of our bus network, our streetcar network, our um, where our LRTs are going to go. But if the bus only comes once an hour, that's shitty transit. If the bus comes every three minutes, that's fantastic transit. So getting the line on the map isn't enough. The operations of the transit system is critical. And I say this because we built transit systems that we then sort of mothball. Like if you look at the service level on the weekend of the subway out to Vaughan, it's nearly non-existent. So we literally built a subway system that doesn't have any of the urban intensity to make it a viable part of the network. So I will say, well, a lot of that has to do with how we fund operations. And this is a real risk with, with the Eglinton Crosstown because one of the things that there's a big contention over right now is the operating agreement between the TTC and Metrolinx. That's something that hasn't been resolved. They're still fighting about it. And I would like a premier to sit down at the table and get that fucking thing done. Like get it done tomorrow, sit down, job number one, get that operating agreement over the finish line. I would also like a premier who would sit down at the table tomorrow and resolve the outstanding disputes with, between Metrolinx and the entity that's building the line because it's 99.9% .9 built and it's not open and we don't have a date for it to be opened. We need, we, we need but to it wouldn't work. It wouldn't done. work. Isn't, isn't there a bunch of stuff wrong? Like, I mean, I, I, let's just take a step back. Ottawa LRT, Ugh. Eglinton Crosstown, Edmonton LRT, right? These things are massive disasters. Massive. It's unclear when they'll ever be functional, right? There may be catastrophic mistakes that may have been made that will require new equipment and all this kind of stuff in Ottawa, for example. Um, and, and in Toronto, I mean, somehow, as you say, it's acceptable for that to be the case that there is no anticipated completion date for that project, right? I don't get it. Well, you're What's getting going on? Why, some, what, what, what is going wrong with these construction projects? Well, you're getting at something that's been bumbling around in my brain for the past couple of days and couple, couple of weeks. What links all of these things together? Um, you know, what's happening on the housing supply side, the, the, the disconnect between immigration and housing supply, um, the homelessness issues, what's happening around mental health and how, what links all of these things together? Well, you need good governance. You need people governing who know what they're doing. And I will say, um, I feel like we have a crisis of governance in our country. And I don't know why we're not talking about it because look, Getting that LRT done on Eglinton, you need someone who's going to show up at work tomorrow and sit down at the table and go like this on their desk, clear their desk and saying, I'm not resting until we resolve this. We built an LRT and it's just sitting there. I'm going to, this is my number one priority. I'm not going out and doing a PR campaign on something. I'm going to get the job done. Um, so I think there's a crisis of governance. Who's holding Metrolinx accountable? I, I don't see it right now. Who's holding the consultant? I don't even know who they're accountable to. Well, this is the weird thing that's happening right now is that, and that's a governance issue, right? And why is the media not doing a deep dive into this and saying, hey, you know, and, and why is it that these private public partnerships that were designed to mitigate the risk to the public sector because there was it was going to cost us more, but the risk would be borne by the consortium. Well, that hasn't played out. Where's the accountability? Like, where is the accountability? I truly believe we have a governance crisis and we have an accountability crisis. And I, you know, I, I don't know how that gets solved, which is why it's bumbling around in my brain. But I think I'm going to start to get very loud about this because... Um, it's reaching an absolute crisis point. Um, the Eglinton Crosstown is, it's inconceivable. Well, Ottawa, what's happened there is inconceivable. All these projects, it's inconceivable. Um, and there's and there's absolutely zero accountability. Um, yeah, I mean, the Ottawa thing is a joke because they threw out the old system and the new system doesn't work. It's just chaos in that, in that town. But, I mean, this P3 concept, let's just bell the cat on this. This is bullshit, right? And we shouldn't be looking totally. to insert the profit motive into public transit, should we? 
Well, absolutely not. And look, even if you had a public entity that administered the project, but again, eh, governance problem, um, you need, like in some ways what we're getting at, David, is you you really need strong public institutions to deliver these types of projects. And I just don't think we have strong public institutions. I think we have a series of strug- public institutions that for whatever reason um, have not been held accountable Um like, you know, Metrolinks, um, Metrolinks kind of, I, I just don't understand why there's no accountability. There's no conversation about accountability. It's very bizarre to me. And I don't know, is this because the media is going up in flames right now? Like, I just, I don't know why that's not happening. But, you know, you need the media, you need the accountability, you need institutions that are also properly funded. And then you do need really strong, strong public policy. Like, I think, um What's happening around safe injection sites, which links into the homelessness problem? Why are we not talking about that? We have people in utter despair on the streets of our city. And to your point earlier, like, I don't think there's a a single person in the city of Toronto that is okay with that. Uh, You know, I would, I would like us to have the resources and the institutions to ensure that people that are in despair are getting treatment and care. And that's not happening right now. People are in distress, writhing in public parks um, as a result of a drug addiction. And we're sort of standing by and throwing our hands up and saying, we don't know what to do. We actually do. We just need to do it. Um, So, you know, you're the only person. Now, you won't like me after I say this, even though I'm starting with you're the only person. You're the only person (laughs) in my life, in my 61 years, who has ever convinced me to take public transit. Um, Yay. <laughs> well, I looked, I, when I, I'm from Regina, where I am right now in this lovely Delta Hotel. Look at my backdrop. And uh, thanks for joining the Hurley Birdie Western Swing this week, uh, uh, Jennifer. And uh, <laughs> so I'm from Regina, driving culture. But when I moved to Montreal, I drove. When I lived in Ottawa, I drove. Um, and so now I live in Toronto, and you convinced me to use public transit. And here's how you convinced me. You convinced me because I live two blocks from King Street. Okay? And you did that King Street pilot. Yep. Where you really restricted the use of cars on King Street. They could drive one block, and then they had to turn right. Right? So there's not a lot of cars on King Street to fight with the streetcar. So all of a sudden, three things came together. The streetcar was two blocks from my house. The streetcar came so regularly that I could just walk to King and know that within a very quick period of time, there would be a streetcar. And the streetcar got to my destination in a very timely fashion. So it was faster for me. It was no compromise for me to use public transit. I don't like to compromise. I like my toast buttered to the edges. And in that one instance, you buttered it to the edges for me. That actually gets to the point I was making about the, it's not just the line on the map. So it's not just like, oh, we build the Ontario line, we build the Finch LRT and we've got a great transit system. Frequency matters because transit has to be a better option. It has to be a better option. I don't think it's fair. Uh, People have busy lives. I don't think it's fair to ask people to say, well, you're going to be really inconvenienced, but take transit for the public good. I don't think that's fair, which is why I think the King, the King Street pilot, which, by the way, my vision, and of course, I left office before I could continue to do this. And for whatever reason, the ball got dropped. My vision was that there was actually a system of those types of initiatives across the entire city so that not just for you in the downtown, but kind of everywhere, people could start seeing that calculus and making that choice. And I think until we do that, um, your earlier question about what's the future of cars, well, The future of cars is up in the air. It depends on whether we can deliver on the promise of a transit and walkable city. And that promise goes right into quality of life, which you've just outlined. Thanks for telling me that. You've made my day. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think the, the last question I really have time for for you is, do cities have enough money? When I was working with Paul Martin in the early 2000s, he had identified lack of revenue for cities and lack of taxation options for cities as a real problem. Saw the growing burden that was going to be falling on city infrastructure and he created a dedicated gas tax uh, revenue flow to the cities. Um, Picking up where we are at now, like I watched the mayoralty election in Toronto and I was saying to myself, how much does it matter who wins? 
Because if you don't have any more money than John Tory had, how are you going to be significantly different than John Tory was? Um, and so what is, am I, a, am I correct that they're strapped for cash? And B, what are some options for dealing with that? You are correct that they're strapped for cash. Um, there's a $1.5 billion gap in the budget for 2024. And we have a 10-year capital plan that, I don't know, it's like $20 billion. It's completely unfunded. So, And that's for needed infrastructure. We're not talking about pretty parks because we fund that kind of stuff out of our um, development uh, development fees. But we're talking about replacing the water pipes so that when we build a new condo, you can get water up to the third 30th floor. <laughs> People can take a shower on the 30th floor, right? Like that mm. is that is un, uh, unfunded. So I have two answers to this question. On the one hand, yes. And I think this is different for different municipalities and different, different places. Um, and sprawl is very expensive. So when we look at smaller municipalities that are sprawling, I kind of look at them and I don't feel a lot of sympathy because I'm like, look, you know, you actually have a model of urban growth that doesn't work. The math is too high. You know, when you've got 60 foot properties on, you know, wide road right of ways, your snow plowing is expensive. Getting water to those units, is, those homes is expensive. Um, you know, you, you haven't done the math. And there's the Smart Prosperity Institute has phenomenal data on this that shows how urban versus urban costs compare. Um, but when we look at the city of Toronto, um, the, the truth is a city this, the, of our scale that needs a pretty sophisticated infrastructure, right? Like our parks are in very high demand. Our parks get exceptionally well used. They need a higher level of maintenance uh, than a park that has a few hundred people a day. Like we have parks where 10,000 people a day show up in that park in downtown Toronto. You've got to do a really good job of picking up the garbage and cleaning the sidewalks. And there's there's a lot more work to do. Um, I think that there's new models are required. And, you know, the um, the gas tag initiative and the work that Paul Martin did, I actually thought was phenomenal and was the begin. It was actually the beginning of a recognition that we needed new models for cities and communities. So it was it was a turning point in many ways. And now there have been ebbs and flows and how that's unfolded. But, for example, in the city of Toronto, there's a long list of revenues Um I reported to council on a list of, um, I think there were 32 revenue tools for generating revenue for everything from transit to funding affordable housing that we reported out on. Of those 32 tools, the cities had um, the, let's say, guts to proceed with almost none of them. But um, some of them do require provincial approval. So one of them was tolls. And you may remember famously, we worked very hard to get John Tory to support tolls. I had meeting after meeting after meeting with like to get his brain there because it was very hard for him to to um, connect tolls with his politics. But he did in the end, he supported uh, putting tolls on the Gardner and the DVP. And then the Kathleen Wynne government killed it. Um, which was, you know, boo boo on them because it would have been really significant if that had happened. Well, wait. In uh, fairness to her, let me throw you her counter argument and see what your response to it is. Sure. Okay, because like, that was a controversial decision, and there was some controversy about whether or not she'd misled Mayor Tory about her support for that. And her position, as I understood it, was that she's totally supportive of tolls as long as people have a non-toll option. If there was a legitimate transit system that people could have circumvented um, the uh, the highway tolls with, but she didn't feel that it was reasonable to just add tolls to a system that people relied on and had no option to. Okay, I'm going to counter that with a story, um, something that happened at that time. I was on, um, and I told this story on the CBC around that time. Um, uh, I tweeted out about the, about the, uh, I went on the CBC and I told the story about the poll, the tolls and what we were trying to do. And someone tweeted back at me and said to me, you know what? Um, I'm totally against this. If you do this, I'm going to have to consider carpooling. That's my answer to you. Um, there's lots of options like, you know, we and it does take a reorientation about how we think about about mobility. Um, but another really great example is, um, yeah, um, linked together 
putting tolls in place with creating really rapid BRT uh, coming into the city. You know, the 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 bus on Avenue Road, um, Avenue Road is um, just, you know, jammed with traffic, people driving in a straight line, you know, from like midtown Toronto into, into the downtown. The Avenue Road bus runs every 20, 25 minutes. Well, what happened if the Avenue Road bus ran every two minutes? People like, you know, people getting in their cars would go, oh, I'm walking when I get downtown anyway. I'll just get on the Avenue Road bus. Choo, choo. Right, right downtown, but the Avenue Road bus runs every twenty minutes, and it, you know I live not far from there, and I've seen the service go down, down, down over the course of the past ten years. So, in some ways, I will say that um, that sounds to me like an excuse because there's no reason why you couldn't link together the tolls with a whole series of initiatives, which, by the way, have been done in other cities in the world very successfully, very rapidly, and that's what I wanted to demonstrate with the King Street pilot. My whole ambition with the King Street pilot, everyone said it couldn't be done, was to say, you know what, I, there's things we can do on the operational side to change our transit use. But we're so obsessed with major infrastructure projects that take decades that we throw our hands in the air and say, nothing can change, nothing can change. And so I wanted to demonstrate, no, 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 look, there's things we can do. And for every King Street pilot, for, for the King Street pilot, there's you know, there's many other ideas of things that you can do very quickly with a little bit of political. But wealth. we don't have anywhere near enough rolling stock for every streetcar line to have gotten streetcars as frequently as I was getting them on the King Street pilot, right? Um, that's true. We strategically, um, this is where all the pieces had to come together. We strategically saw an opportunity when we knew we had new streetcars coming and we it was in some ways part of the motivation of doing it in the mode we mo the moment that we did was we were able to link, you know, we were able to look at the bigger picture and say, hold on a minute, we have these new street cars coming in. What if we got cars out of the way? What like what if, what if, what if and we put all the pieces together? So um, but right now we have rolling stock that's not being used with respect to buses because we've cut the bus service back so much post COVID. So, you know, we've cut subway service back. Um, you know. Uh, the subway service has cut back significantly. So we've got the subways, we've got, we built the subway line, but then we're not using it. We're letting it sit. And a lot of people in Toronto, rightly, and outside of Toronto have said, oh, well, I'm going to get in my car then because it's just too, it's just too unreliable. So, um, you know, I think you have to, you have to look at what the future possibility is that you want and then build the strategy and the plan to deliver on it. So that's what I didn't like about Kathleen Wynne's response. Hers response was no, because instead of yes, and this is how we'll do it. This is the plan that needs to come together to deliver on this, on this big, on this big idea. So let me just tell you very quickly a couple of the other things. Um, well, I'll tell you one because it's a really big, powerful one that could easily be done. Commercial parking levy. Um, a significant amount of revenue can be generated for the city of Toronto through a commercial parking levy. The city of Toronto already has the authority through the city of Toronto act. What, what is that? It, um, it's a, it's a, 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 a tax on parking spots essentially in the city of Toronto. So you can imagine you create a area in the downtown core. And right now, although we haven't seen businesses come back the way, you know, to the post COVID um, kind of occupancy, um, a lot of people are driving downtown, right? So there's a, you know, on the one hand, if people want to drive downtown, it's going to generate lots of revenue. If you put a, a com commercial parking levy, um, on the other hand, it might be a disincentive to people driving downtown and they might end up on transit. Ooh, that's a win. <laughs> so it's kind of a, from a public policy perspective, it's, it's, it's a win-win. And I do think you need a whole series of different um, revenue mechanisms. I also will just say on the not having money, you also, the city has to stop doing stupid things like rebuilding a tiny, tiny little portion of the Gardner Expressway to the tune of billions of dollars that serves 3% of commuters. It's bad public policy. Um, my children's children are going to. How come we could once down. afford the gardener and we can't afford the gardener now? Like, what the fuck is that about? Like, we had the gardener in the sixties. Well, um, in the sixties, uh, the the big big issue is that, and it kind of gets to what we've been talking about about transit, which is 
we always think about big shiny objects and funding them as a capital project, but we don't think about the long-term operations. Putting highways in the sky in the 60s, which people thought was solved um, a problem of getting through places really quickly, turned out it was bad urbanism because it actually destroyed the city. It made the city a place to get through instead of a place to be and also acted as a funnel, dumps too many cars into the urban fabric. So when an expressway does work, the problem is it's just like this huge funnel dumping too many cars into the urban environment that it can't absorb. So um, the no one really accounted for the astronomical costs of maintaining concrete in the sky. So uh, it's very, very expensive because we're a winter city, we use salt. The salt der- erodes the gardeners. The guard. This is why. Remember, a few years ago, there was you know all of the news about big chunks of concrete falling off the gardener and almost killing people. Mm. Um, that's because it's super expensive to have this highway in the sky. Not just the initial cost of building it, but maintaining it over the long term. Eh, it doesn't. You know, the cost benefit analysis doesn't actually work. Now, for most of the gardener, the decision has already been made to reinvest in it for another generation. Um, but for this little tiny portion of the Gardner East, um, why are we, we've already taken part of it down and now we're rebuilding it like a few hundred meters to the north. Why? It's an absurdity. So wasting money is still a problem the city has, not leveraging their money. And I do think that's a problem. And I think that I understand when the feds go, hey, go clean up your own own house before you start asking us for money. All right. Um Okay, listen, this has been such a fantastic conversation, but I can't leave it without, because, you know, so much of what you've talked about sounds to me like you like to use public policy to nudge people toward directions you want them to go in. Um, they may not be there right now, but you're going to nudge them in that direction. That's what that's kind of what you sounded like to me today, which I think is really interesting. And you ran politically you took it you put your foot into the political waters um so thank you for that by the way we need people of caliber and experience committing themselves to public office so thank you for doing that what did you learn from that process oh my goodness um so i think i learned um I learned so many things. Um, you know, I learned things obviously personally about myself. Um, and um, uh, Don Guy said to me after the election, um, he said, "You know, people typically when they when they don't win, they're usually they're either stronger or they're weaker. Some people like you know kind of disappear and you never hear from them again, and some people come on even stronger." And I was like, oh, wow, I like totally found my strength. I and in part because I discovered that I could go up against a really formidable political opponent who ran, um, no question, a very nasty campaign. Um, uh, There's a lot that happened behind the scenes that I don't talk about because I, you know, try I want to go high. Um, who ran a very nasty campaign, and I didn't. I ran a public policy campaign, and I kind of stayed true to um, my values, which I think is a really... Those almost always lose, I hate to tell you. Yeah, 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 that's probably true, which is probably maybe why I I wouldn't be a good politician ever, Um, (laughs) because I could never win. I'm 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 just never going to do that, um, because it's not, it's not, the legacy of my family. It's not how I was raised and it's not the person I want to be in the world. Um, and that's maybe, that's maybe the other thing that I, that I learned is that it's very, very hard, um, much harder than I had expected to get on that platform and to be, you know, taking it on the chin from every side and hold your ground. It's like, you know, being in a boxing match is a really good, a really good metaphor. How do you hold your ground? How do you not like end up back on your heels? How do you kind of lean it, lean in and hold your ground? And I, I'm very proud of the fact that I did lean in. I held my ground and I also discovered I can take a lot of crap. (laughs) I can take a lot of crap on the chin and yeah, 
you know, I'm, I sleep well at night. You know, I, I, I know who I am. I, I, I can take a lot on the chin. So that was, that was what I learned. But I also learned that we've made it very difficult. Um, I think it's very difficult to be a policy oriented candidate um, and to, to actually win. Like so much of it is about strategies and tactics and, um, you know, getting your photo with the right person at the right time, um, as opposed to ideas. And that's hard for me because you can see, I like to get stuff done and I like to test ideas in the world. And I'm really doing that with my development company right now. Um, but I don't care about all the other stuff. Like I, you know, I really don't care that much about the other, about the other stuff. The other thing I'll say, which is really important is that, um, we, we haven't really reckoned as a society yet with women in politics and women in the public realm. And I could tell you some stories. We'll save that for another day um, about stuff that happened to me on the campaign trail <laughs> by people who you know and respect. I'm sure um, that would make your head spin. And you would think, I'm 100% confident you would go, oh, wow, you have to deal with that shit. Like, mm. You know, you had to deal with that. And that was some of the hardest, the hardest stuff. And um, and there were moments where I was like, man, like, I just wish I was a guy and I didn't have to deal with this garbage because the garbage gets in your brain and it makes it hard to stay on task and to stay really focused. And unfortunately, women in politics have this whole other domain that they're constantly having to look out for and manage and be careful about than guys do. It's just a fact, it you know, really and, um, so that's, that's, a, that's an unfortunate thing. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a, an old economist from the eighties named Lester Thoreau once said that the job of government is to represent the future to the present. Um, but you have to get elected in the present. And one of the tricks of politics is not running to the electorate you wish you had, but running to the electorate you actually have. <laughs> that's brilliant. I think mm. that's so, I think that's so true. Um, and you know, I think the obligation of our leaders is um, to be forward-looking and to act courageously and what i'm what i'm not sure of is whether as a society we want that that's that present problem i'm not sure we don't want our politicians to be truth tellers and to and to drag us into the future <laughs> right we sort yeah. of want them to make us feel good about the way we are today and that makes that makes the challenge of running for political office really, really acute. And is, you know, one of the reasons why we get the the types that we do get in political office today. But I think, um, you know, I do think that bizarrely I had, I, I kind of was able to carve out this fascinating space as the chief planner where I was able to act courageously. I did a lot of stuff that quite frankly, like, you know, wasn't in my mandate, right? Like I, but I, you know, and it was actually um, police chief Blair, who I've gotten to know quite well over the years who, um, you know, we had a conversation about this very early on about some of the stuff he did as chief of police that really wasn't his mandate, but he like, you know, kind of stuck his elbows out and, I call it expanding your sphere of influence. And I think that's one of the things that great leaders need to do is expand their sphere of influence. And I think that it's tricky to do that. Um, it can be tricky. Great leaders do it. Um, the mayor of Paris is doing it right now. She's a great leader. She's expanding her sphere of influence in a really powerful way. Um, but yeah, I think that's a fantastic quote. <laughs> that is, uh, checks out with my reality. Listen, I'd like to thank everybody out there who watched or listened to Jennifer and I talking about this stuff today. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. And Jennifer, thank you so much for such an engaging and enlightening conversation. Had a great time, and you're fun to talk with. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This was, a, this was a ton of fun. The time just 
the time just flew by. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week with more of the Hurley Burley.